This is episode 359 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, uh, last night or late afternoon in a last-ditch effort post-election and on the eve of the runoff election in city council here, the Albuquerque City Council, uh, they're the liberal wing that dominates the council currently pushed through a big union giveaway called a Project Labor Agreement. This is something we talked about a while back that Bernalillo County adopted. and They adopted, but then the first project that came up, they said, well, now wait a minute, this costs a lot more money and doesn't get us any more buildings, so we need to maybe start it a little later. So, <laughs> Right, and uh, it's for public works projects. Uh, this, of course, will affect the city <clears throat> itself and uh, city taxpayers, more importantly. Uh, it could raise the price because essentially a project labor agreement is an agreement ahead of time between the two parties, uh, whether the city and whoever's offering the contract in this case, and the, uh, uh, the, the unions to make all of the workers union workers. Uh, and this is a very generous uh, giveaway to the unions because only 8 to 10% of all tradesmen and tradespeople in the state who work on these construction projects are unionized. And, and essentially it uh, forces people who want to work on some of these big projects. And this is New Mexico, so government tends to be a outsized player in uh, every market, but construction for sure. And uh, this thing was only introduced right around election time. I don't know if it was right before, right after. It was rammed through very quickly. Uh, some question whether it was even legal because it doesn't didn't really hit all the, the committees and move in the you know normal process where you have multiple meetings and all those kinds of things. But <clears throat> it is. Uh, I was on the meeting last night. It was a Zoom meeting, which again is total garbage. That you're still having Zoom meetings. I'm sorry. Um, in nearly two ends, two years into this situation, but. Uh, you know, it just shows the importance of these uh, two runoff elections. Maybe, just maybe, a veto, veto-proof veto majority that can override Mayor Keller on some of these big issues will uh, restore sanity, balance to the order, if you will, uh, in the city of Albuquerque. But absent that, uh, you know, we've got another horrible policy being passed uh, by Albuquerque City Council and its leftist members. Yeah, Paul, you know, I've uh, I've had a lot of association with unions. I've had to work in uh, summer jobs with unionism. And, you know, it's one of those uh, things, you know, free association under the Constitution, that's fine. But do we need laws that say it has to, has to be union uh labor. Uh, and then, you know, this is above and beyond. This is every piece of it. This goes above little Davis Bacon, as I understand it, which big Davis Bacon is you pay what's quote unquote called prevailing wage, which like a lot of these terminologies, uh, it's exactly the opposite of what it says. So prevailing wage should be a competitive wage that's, you know, out there in the marketplace, but they're like, no, we, we know what it needs to be. And uh, the result is, is we get a lot less building for the buck. You know, mm -hmm. places like Arizona that don't have uh, Little Davis Bacon and don't have these project labor agreements, you know, their costs somewhere. They used to say there was around half the price for a school, but, you know, I've seen some statistics lately. Look, it's like a third less. So, you know, basically you could get, uh, you know, you could get, three projects instead of two uh, mm -hmm. for dollar for dollar. And that's why these are important. It also, also in, you know, some projects, union labor can be very competitive. You know what I mean? So they can be competitive. But if you say, nope, union only can get it, uh, then it just takes away a lot of the uh, competitiveness. And, uh, you know, there's always the thing about, oh, these evil contractors are rigging their bids. It's like, you don't have to rig the bids. You know, you've already taken out 90% of the competition just by the public policy that the state of New Mexico and now increasingly Bernalillo County and now the city council of Albuquerque put into uh, in, 
in, into effect? Yeah, I don't believe the state has a uh, project labor agreement requirement. No, and, and you I, do I have the yeah. Davis Bacon, and that's you know that's the that's the starting place. This is right. uh, what will we call this Davis Bacon on steroids now. Yeah, and uh, it is highly unsurprising that uh, this was done. You know, as we saw a more conservative uh, group being elected to city council, uh, I, I think the special interests at uh, at play that have a lot of power in local government uh, got in touch with. Ironically, the the two sponsors of this effort were Bore- <laughs> Borrego and Land Senate, two West Side uh, left leaning uh, counselors who are not going to be rejoining the council in January. And they went ahead and pushed this in in kind of the lame duck uh, city council, which is is problematic by itself. But uh, we shall see. I I think uh, the simplest routes, and I've talked to people who are engaged in this uh, debate, the simplest route is simply to have the majority uh the new majority hopefully that is a six to three coalition of the sane you got to win both of these races Lori robertson and renee grout if those two do not win then you're really stuck with uh, a five to four majority which uh, with the progressive uh, so to speak mayor keller uh, isn't gonna very likely to veto it if yeah. it were to get in and we're there. assuming that he will sign this legislation uh I suspect that they would not go through the time and effort of pushing this through the council in the waning uh, days of the lame duck without some uh, acknowledgement that this will be adopted by uh, our our boy mayor, Tim Keller. All right, well, uh, we've talked about one topic and no COVID. We're going to talk about a second topic, and it's at least semi-unrelated to COVID, so we're we're on a roll here. Um, Special session in Santa Fe has kicked off this week on Monday. This is primarily a redistricting session. There will be a discussion of distributing some federal COVID relief money. Uh, This is, of course, the product of a lawsuit that uh, the bipartisan group of legislators won against Michelle Lujan Grisham, who had taken it upon herself and said, oh, I'm going to do all this distributing of money myself. And uh, of course, if you go into the roundhouse, be prepared to show proof of vaccination. Also, hey, and be- Paul, do we know what that means? Is that two or three? Are we still a two as proof and one if the Johnson and Johnson, have we uh, turned the clock on one that? One if by I, land, two if by sea. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> seen that yet. So I think two will get you in, but I'm not positive about that. Yeah, I think it is the baseline uh, vaccinated rate, but who knows? Uh, and, and I think if you show up with something on your phone, you should be okay, but haven't been up there yet. I plan on... Uh, making the trek up to Santa Fe just to see folks that didn't get to see them last uh, winter. And uh, it's always good to connect with the folks who represent us in Santa Fe, no matter how well or poorly they do their jobs. And uh, of course, numbers are really the issue. Uh, But there will also be metal detectors at the doors because uh, they're pushing against guns. And this is Of course, all coming from the majority Democratic uh, Party group that controls uh, the roundhouse and uh, really is inclined to further restrictions on getting people into that building. Of course, last year it was all closed or early this year. It was always it was closed completely off to the public. Uh, A lot of legislating was done uh, behind closed doors without, you know, public interaction except for on Zoom. And then finally, in big news, as the session kicked off, Jacob Candelaria, state senator, he, of course, was involved in the lawsuit. He led the lawsuit, if you will, to free up those dollars for the legislature to spend as opposed to just the governor. He was a Democrat senator until recently. Also on the west side of Albuquerque, he is now an independent, or DTS. So, uh, Beginning with a bang there, Wally. Yeah, and you know, Jake is on the way out. He uh, definitely has been uh, fighting uh, the governor and the Democratic Party. So, uh, you know, that's one of those. It's uh, 
I don't know, an important symbolic gesture, but I have a feeling uh, in terms of impact, it's going to be very, very minor in terms of what it'll mean for uh, the rest of uh, Senator Candelaria's uh, legislative career relative to what legislation goes forward. Well, so. he, just to be clear, he is a senator, so he's technically not up for re-election until... 2024. No, so he'll be around for a while, but you know, the point, you know, as you mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, alluded to, there's numbers and there's an overwhelming number True. of Democrats. And so uh, if something is going to happen, and even if J Jacob Candelaria were, and this is not likely to happen, let's just say, for example, he would take the Republican position on every piece of legislation right. going forward. What are the chances that this would happen? And, you know, uh, Alicio Alcone also uh, had. There was a time um, many years ago where he refused to caucus with the Democrats. And again, uh, it's highly symbolic. Uh, it's great news. It, it's uh, it's so popperish fighting, but I don't think uh, it's going to have much policy impact in New Mexico. Maybe I'm wrong. but Right. You know. The numbers are not there, but uh, it is a symbolic gesture. And Jacob is, uh, you know, I'll say this, he, he on policy by and large is a very progressive Democrat. He is a volatile personality, however, and uh, sometimes that works to the advantage of good government and uh, kind of a, uh, an alignment with, and, and we, we support the, the legislature uh, separation of powers in all in terms of uh, their fight with the governor over this, uh, this Recovery Act money, but this was never uh, the cause celeb of the Rio Grande Foundation. We hardly talked about it because ultimately we weren't really fans of the stimulus money itself being printed up in Washington and, and doled out. We thought the, uh, even the first one uh, from President Trump was misguided because uh, all you're doing is subsidizing state policies, states locking down like New Mexico, uh, and it, the subsequent trillions of dollars that they printed up in Washington were also uh, unnecessary and harmful to the uh, country as, uh, as an entire uh, package as we're seeing now with if with rampant inflation yes. uh, you know and then you know just one final point paul too uh yes the uh candelaria was uh rightly as proved by the supreme court in the correctly that uh the governor was overstating uh overstepping her uh power uh constitutionally but also he's uh faced several challenges from others within his party you know uh mainly uh, separate our Senator Mimi Stewart and he have butted heads. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know what, this could be a, this could be a good thing though. I mean, just let me just put my, uh, my wish upon a star is that he might ask a few tough questions that maybe he wouldn't have asked because, you know, he is a, a bright guy. He's an independent thinker and, uh, maybe he'll ask some questions that he wouldn't have asked, uh, if he were continuing to be a Democrat. Very true. Indeed. So, uh, like I said, uh, this session is going on now. Uh, the legislature, the roundhouse is open to the public uh, in a way that it wasn't earlier in the year. Uh, thankfully, and, and we're, we applaud this, uh, they are focusing on the kind of bread and butter issues of drawing those district lines. Uh, so Brian Egolf is studiously looking for ways to uh, stick it to Representative Yvette Harrell in Congress and make that uh, congressional district, the second district, unwinnable, or at least harder to win for a Republican. And, you know, again, with redistricting, it's all about uh, putting candidates out there and winning races. Uh, they, the Democrats can definitely draw three congressional districts that will be marginally uh, pro-Democrat in their, their performance, but... Uh, you know, it ultimately comes down to you've got to want to run a good campaign, have good messaging, and uh, that's a, across the country. And right now, there's a lot of momentum on the Republican side. And if the Democrats get too creative, so to speak, with some of those districts, it could wind up biting them in the uh, in the posterior. But yeah, because you know they basically, in order to uh, make the Avet Harrell much more winnable for Democrats. They could expose one or both of the other districts. And again, uh, 
right now there's lots of Democrats in New Mexico. And then, Paul, just on a national scene, you know, it's one of those, the party in power on the uh, every 10 years are the ones that draw or have a lot to say about drawing the borders. And uh, nationwide, we're seeing the same thing going the other way, you know. So the numbers uh, nationally, are, it's looking like it's probably better for Republicans in terms of districting and the all all 50 states with New Mexico going the other way uh, against the trend. Yeah. Um, so that w- that is uh, going to be something we watch here and uh, something, you know, finally, uh, after a few subjects we've talked about that we continue to watch is the uh, COVID-19 situation in New Mexico. Now, last week we were pretty optimistic. It looked like the COVID numbers were starting to move in the right direction, as they so often do seasonally, uh, whereas they peaked in New Mexico in terms of the cases, new cases, uh, on or about November 24th, 23rd last year, and uh, started to drop very quickly. Well, uh, the same thing had started in New Mexico, and we saw a drop, and then at the beginning of December, we suddenly saw a big increase. Uh, in fact, November 29th, seven-day moving average, uh, that number had dropped to just over 1,000, 1,080. But unfortunately, here as we sit on December the 6th, well, the 7th is uh, the date, but the 6th is the last day that we have. The case count is up to 1,596. Uh, we shall see. Uh, COVID continues to surprise. We still... Uh, all the evidence is that this is a highly seasonal uh, virus, but of course we've had a warm fall. Uh, we'll, we'll see what colder weather actually does. Maybe um, some of those cases that would have come about during the fall uh, have been kind of put in abeyance until we're actually all together in close quarters uh, inside Um and, and, you know, it's just hard to say. We don't know what Omicron is going to do uh, with regard to further uh, outbreaks here in New Mexico. But the uh, uh, virus situation remains volatile. And I think the uh, takeaway continues to be whatever Governor Lujan Christian is doing, it still remains ineffective. And uh, you, know, you can bet that a couple more weeks of declines and she would have been out in a press conference crowing about how wonderful things were going, how keep masking, everything's going great. Uh, now uh, we're obviously moving in a different direction and we'll see how long this latest uptick lasts. Yeah. So in addition to having certainly some seasonality, even if you were to look at tons of charts, and I did this until my eyes uh, almost popped out of my head, is it's certainly cyclical. You know, you look everywhere, even if you say, well, it's like, what season is this doing it? It goes up and it goes down and it tends to uh, do that. And we're in the, uh, not our all time high necessarily on a long-term basis, but yeah, things are up right now. And uh, when that, you know, when will it turn down? And we know it will, it has everywhere else all the time because, you know, you run out of, you run out of people to get it, you know, in terms of, uh, who's getting it. So hopefully that will be soon for New Mexico. But yes, uh, the uncertainty of COVID, uh, e- even even the great ones in Washington, the all-knowing and all-powerful uh, uh, CDC and uh, NIH and other folks that you know used to speak with a whole lot more certainty are starting to talk about, well, we think or we anticipate or you know, they've been proven wrong so many times on this. I think even they're getting tired of being wrong. So they're, they're like weathermen. You're like, okay, well, oh, it wasn't it quite as, uh, it wasn't quite as dry as we anticipated. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see about the weather and, uh, hopefully we get some nice <laughs> snow, if nothing else for than for the ski areas. Although I, I enjoy, I would love to see a white Christmas in New Mexico. Count me among that group, <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll digress. Um, well, the governor this week, uh, gotta love her timing sometimes on these, uh, issues. Uh, I guess gas prices have come down enough, but she's been talking about the idea of a clean fuel standard for, uh, months now. It was a priority in the 2021 session that early, early this year. Uh, it failed 
barely, uh, but the Environment Dep Department here in New Mexico has put out a bill, uh, a draft text of a bill that would uh, increase the uh, requirements for so-called uh, renewable sources of, uh, of fuel in your gas tank. We believe this to be primarily ethanol, although some other biofuels would count. The idea is to reduce carbon emissions from your gas, uh, burning of gasoline in your gas tank by 20%. And, 20 and then move them to growing ethanol. So yeah, it's like... It's 30% by 2040. Uh, and it really is hard to understand. Uh, and while we're often critical of the governor, this, this particular policy makes so little sense in so many ways. Uh, for starters, ethanol at the federal level has been around for many moons uh, back since the 70s. Uh, the prime organization, the prime group that keeps that going is not environmentalists. It's Iowa, Iowa corn far farmers. Yeah, who, uh, who get an early take at the presidential exactly, election. Exactly, yeah. So, so uh, you know, the joke has been for decades that if you want to eliminate ethanol or uh, address ethanol, then you've got to change the primary schedule for presidential campaigns. But as long as Iowa has such an early seat at the table, uh, those Iowa farmers are going to play an outsized role in, uh, in various policies, including ethanol. But we don't have corn farmers in New Mexico. I mean, I'm not saying you can't find one, but... No, there's not a lot of corn here, so uh, yeah. we're... Uh, the corn lobby is certainly not a factor in no, Santa Fe. There is they're, no not, big corn in New Mexico. They're not pushing the governor to enact this policy. They're not giving a lot of campaign contributions. So on a pure political level, it doesn't make sense. And then uh, you look at studies of ethanol, because, of course, ethanol has been around for decades None other than the U.S. EPA did a report. Uh, we linked to it at Errors of Enchantment. You can go find it for yourself. And they raised concerns with ethanol creating nitrous oxide in the atmosphere when burned. And that creates something called ozone, which uh, the EPA identifies as a major pollutant. That's one major problem. Of course, Growing corn, whether it's here in New Mexico or more likely in the Midwest, requires lots of pesticides, clearing of land that could otherwise be reforested or grow uh, you know, some kind of wild grasses and become a much more natural environment than the monoculture uh, corn fields uh, for whatever you, know, you like or dislike about them. Uh, and there are numerous other problems, the pesticides, the processing, all the energy that goes into and the, corn. The and the water. The, and water. the water. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, all of that requires massive quantities of energy. And then you get it in your tank. And anyone who knows anything about engines will tell you that ethanol can do a number on certain engines, especially if it's in them for a long time. Yeah, because it absorbs water much more readily than uh, gasoline. So, you know, you can, uh, if you have a lawnmower, for example, and you just leave it over the winter with no ethanol in there, it's likely going to be fine. Uh, if you have uh, high ethanol in there, you probably want to drain it or put some sort of a fuel stabilizer to mm -hmm. uh overcome that and then places that get cold and have a lot of uh moisture have have big problems you know and there's certain types of uh engines like places that have a lot of out more outboard uh boat motors they really hate ethanol they really like 100 percent uh non-ethanol fuels right and oh by the way the thing i should have mentioned first perhaps is that uh to do the 20 percent uh, reduction in so-called carbon intensity. I don't even know how they come up with these, yeah. uh, these numbers. It's uh, probably uh, the science, the same science they used on COVID. Uh, we're talking, according to an analysis done by Representative Larry Scott, uh, who works in the oil and gas industry and has a pretty uh, convincing breakdown of the, the information in a Albuquerque Journal opinion piece, uh, it, we're expecting a 35 cent per gallon increase in gasoline prices if this is adopted. And of course, uh, that's directly uh, one of the issues. But there are so few states that have these kind of clean fuel mandates that you're, you know, one of the problems, one of the reasons California gets gas at seven, eight dollars 
uh, a gallon is because they have unique requirements. It's not just the fact that they have different you know, components in their gasoline than you get across the country. It's the fact that they rely on, you know, one refinery or whatever, one source for their gasoline. And that drives up the price potentially if you need to, you know, heaven forbid you have a fire, you have some supply disruption, whatever. Uh, anyway. Hey, Paul, I should have covered my work. I know you didn't look at my notepad here because oh. your monitor's in the way, but yeah. Go ahead. You know, well, the three things I think, uh, the three ways to raise gasoline prices that are most effective are direct taxation. Just put more taxes on sure. it. We know that works uh, penny for penny, but yeah, this fuel standard thing. So broad fuel standards can do it, but then... The more localized and smaller the market the fuel standards apply to, the more likely it is to be high for the very reasons that you talked about. So in Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles uh, Basin may have a different fuel standard than in the uh, interior of California. But, you know, in a place like Los Angeles, uh, there's a lot of people there. New Mexico only has 2 million people. We're spread out far and wide. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if Larry Scott has the 35 cent per gallon estimate, I think uh, I, I would tend to think that that is a, a good estimate. I see things like 20, per, 20 cents in places like California. It makes sense it would be much higher in New Mexico just because of how spread out we are and how there are not any huge populations anywhere. And there's only, you know, uh, half a dozen, you know, counting the Albuquerque, Las Cruces, Santa Fe, Farmington, and none of, you know, None of those, or even all of them put together, ra rises to the level of a place like the Los Angeles Basin. Yeah, yeah there are a lot of problems with this policy, but the governor uh, wants to press forward. And um, right now, uh, she obviously has the votes to do that and, uh, and clearly is making it a top priority. You can comment for what it's worth at cleanfuel.standard at state.nm.us by 5 p.m. Friday, uh, this Friday, December the 10th. I don't expect it'll do a lot of good, but it is always worthwhile whenever I get a chance. I uh, make sure that the politi political powers that be know that I think their schemes are every bit as idiotic as they ultimately generally prove themselves to be. And, uh, and, and this is one that would be uh, really bizarre and harmful, not just to our bottom lines, but to the environment. And Paul, I'll go ahead and make a prediction here is that if this goes into place, you know, there'll be a lot of disruptions. And I don't, I think that places, uh, my guess is places like uh, greater Bernalillo County and uh, will be okay. But I, I could see a lot of little rural areas that were able to get gasoline from, you know, like Clayton, for example, you can get it from Texas, you can get it from Oklahoma. If nobody is refining to this standard, you may have to trek their gasoline from a long, long, long way a ways. And I have a feeling we're going to see some rural areas when this goes into play in New Mexico. If it does, uh, heck, I think we could see, uh, small rural areas in certain areas, their price could probably go up by a dollar or more, at least initially. So we'll see. But you know what? These are unanticipated. Nobody could anticipate any of this. So. Well, uh, more, more importantly, I, I think it's been shown from day one of this administration that the governor does not truly care about rural New Mexico. I'm not saying that just because I don't like her politics. I, I think she has governed under the assumption that the votes are in the big cities and uh, she is going to focus her attention and policies on appealing not just to the average citizen in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces, but kind of the more progressive uh, wing, wings of the Democratic Party in those various areas. And uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, polling doesn't look spectacular for her, but... Uh, we got a long way to go before this election. And uh, one of the things that really has propped up our governor politically and propped up New Mexico's economy is, of course, oil and gas. And we've talked about it at length, but in raw numbers, the industry generated $5.3 billion in revenue for state and local governments in 2021 fiscal year. That's a 12% increase over 2020. 
uh, more than twice as much as 2016, and 35% of all of our general fund revenue for the uh, state of New Mexico in 2021. Now, uh, we know and we've talked at length about the governor and her love-hate relationship with oil and gas. She loves the money, hates the industry. Uh, Of course, a lot of Democrats in the legislature hate the industry. I would cite the 24 that signed the letter uh, applauding Biden administration's moratorium on leases. Uh, Jerry Ortiz Pino, state senator uh, who called for an end to oil and gas in New Mexico in, a, in an op-ed. Uh, the uh, senator who introduces the uh, fracking ban on a regular basis. Uh, name escapes me, but just another hard left Democrat. So uh, these, but the, the point is, is that these folks who most arduously claim that we need to diversify our economy and you know do all these things. Mostly they have the vision of killing oil and gas, but when it comes to actually creating new industries and making New Mexico more economically friendly to attract those industries, they haven't done it. We're more dependent on oil and gas than ever. And that shows no signs of letting up because uh, it's not like the progressive left or the governor are pushing for basic policies like GRT reform or anything that's going to really improve the overall economic picture. Yes. uh, You know, if you if you really believe that and it's you know, it's one of those things, if you really believe that global warming is the existential crisis of our time, I think your eyes would be a little more open and you would be a little more willing to take a look at things like uh, nuclear power, for example. If you want to diversify New Mexico's economy uh, away from oil and gas, I don't see anything that's more pressing than reform of the gross receipts tax. And yet, what do we see? You know, a one quarter of 1% overall reduction without any structural changes to that. So, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you, you know, the thought experiment about what New Mexico looks like with, uh, with oil and gas is, is, uh, used to be frightening to most legislators, fewer and fewer are, but I think they may may find out uh, without some diversification what that would mean. And Paul, there are things that are highly dependent on these uh, additional oil and gas revenues. You know, you talk about sustainability. I think the uh, film tax credit's one of the most dependent on this excess money. You Mm -hmm. know, if we were to have Instead of uh, billions and billions more dollars to spend, if we were to have less to spend, I think that would go out in a heartbeat. So uh, there's a lot of things that, uh, yeah, we we say a lot of things in New Mexico and a lot of things are said, but uh, the actions aren't necessarily lining up with uh, regard to what's likely to help uh, our state. And it gets pretty basic. It's down to... Uh, Tax policy, education, crime, regulation, all of those things, those are the things that uh, can really help diversify an economy and create a a good environment for economic growth. And uh, a lot of things uh, that they talk about aren't necessarily there. They might be good for political growth, but not necessarily economic growth. Yeah. And uh, just to give folks an idea of what we're really talking about, you know, it's... uh, we, we've said it before, but this is both a production-driven boom and a price-driven boom facing New Mexico or benefiting New Mexico, at least the bottom line. Of course, we'd love to see this money used effectively to bring pr- uh, prosperity to the state, to bring uh, economic diversification, to help uh, address tax policy problems that have lingered for years and other economic uh, you know, shortcomings that this state has, including the poverty. But when Governor Lujan Grisham took over, and this is from the Energy Information Agency, uh, in 2019, the boom had just kind of gotten underway in terms of production, uh, in terms of thousands of barrels. So keep in mind, these are thousands of barrels. So just add three more zeros. Uh, Monthly production in New Mexico in January of 2019 was 25,094, which was basically a record at that point in time. The record was actually set the month before in December of 2018. But uh, as of September of 2021, we're at 40,547. So 
not quite doubling, but certainly a big increase in oil production in, in a relatively short time under this governor. So I guess the good news is she hasn't completely put the kibosh on that production growth through state policies. Uh, she definitely um, plays footsie with some of that, uh, but she hasn't done it. And, uh, you know, she just enjoyed spending that money. But to what effect for the state of New Mexico? I can't see a lot of benefits that uh, we've derived. Average citizens, every economic statistic is worse than it was uh, when she took over. So uh, speaking of worse, uh, back to the city of Albuquerque. And this is something that, you know, a lot of people around the state do travel to Albuquerque. If you don't travel here on a regular basis, you've undoubtedly noticed the worsening homeless problem. Uh, but if you do live here, you probably also noticed a worsening homeless problem because it's not a situation that uh, got worse uh, just very gradually. I think it's gotten very significantly worse very quickly. And uh, it, the Channel 4 had a incredible story. And this, this is on the west side, and I live on the west side of Albuquerque, so I have a little bit of an extra soft spot here. But there's a pedestrian bridge over I-40, which is, of course, a major ge geographical barrier. And this uh, woman walks her young child to school, or walked her young child to school to a charter school that was on the opposite side of this pedestrian bridge. Well, uh, the, the footage from Channel 4, and again, you can find this at heirsofenchantment.com. We posted the story right there. Uh, the, this bridge was basically made unusable through the shopping carts and the occupation of large numbers of homeless. We're not talking one or two. We're talking seemingly dozens and dozens of homeless. Have you, have you watched this story yet, Wally? Yeah, I have. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty striking. You know, the only thing that it called to mind a lot of the... Uh, the beaches in California and Los Angeles, you know, area that had similar homeless problem. Yeah. And uh, they interview one of these homeless guys. You can tell he's on some, some drugs because he keeps itching himself. And that's a surefire sign, I believe, of meth. But uh, don't quote me on that. And uh, it's just a very depressing story. And it leads me to believe, you know, and, and they imply that because this is on city property somehow. And the guy, it's very telling. The homeless guy knows enough about the law. He says, we stay away from the private property, but we stay right here on the city property and they don't mess with us. And there's no reason that the city cannot mess with the homeless as in mess with move so that rights of way and basic avenues of transportation, in this case, a child walking to school who now has to drive, be driven to school every single day, that they should not be able to uh, use that pedestrian bridge because the homeless have taken it over. And I use the term homeless, quote unquote, because uh, there are places for them to go. They just don't want to go there. And it, it really made my blood boil and makes me wonder, why are we paying taxes in the city of Albuquerque if these basic, very basic functions of government are not being fulfilled? Yeah, and, and it called to mind a question for me is like, okay, if uh, if there's city property and they can't move the homeless from the city property, why don't they go to a city hall and just camp out in the hallways? The, the temperature is going to be a lot more stable. And so, you know, uh, from my uh, knowledge of trespass law, and, you know, maybe there's something in, the, in Albuquerque, you know, there's a, a lot of laws we have, but maybe there's something that differentiates this. But yes, if you can't... Uh, maintain order if anyone can camp out on any piece of flat ground that's not a building that has a ownership or control by the city of albuquerque that seems like that could be a problem so yeah and uh i, I just uh it, it boggles the minds i know uh the candidates for mayor uh left a lot to be desired here in albuquerque but boy to saddle this city with four more years of this incompetence and uh, unwillingness to enforce basic laws is just, huh, it really gets me going, uh, Wally. So, all right, well, we will move on because uh, uh, there's plenty still to talk about. And uh, speaking of blood boiling, uh, as a parent, we talked about the uh, learning loss due to the pandemic, but mostly due to the governor's uh, keeping our kids out of school. 
And another report has come out. This one's uh, from Politico. The headline, very, very telling. Uh, it's from Jessica Califati, December the 6th, 2021. This is a disaster. Severity of learning loss to the pandemic comes into focus. Well, duh. And um, yes, we've been saying that from day one, that kids being at home and forced to be at home, a la thanks to the governor's policies, which are more restrictive in terms of keeping kids at home during the pandemic than all but five other states. Uh, and, and this report really, uh, there's some good data there, but I think the most telling quote is Michael Petrilli from the Thomas Fordham Institute and Education Reform Organization. This is a disaster. The bottom has fallen out and the results are as bad as you can imagine. We haven't seen this kind of academic achievement crisis in living memory. And uh, if you think it's bad in the other states that they've studied, come to New Mexico where we already perform poorly. We have a lot of family challenges. And of course, it talks about the, the, the report talks about how uh, in reading declines were twice as steep for students at majority Latino schools as they were for children at majority white schools. So uh, the folks who are already trailing and behind mostly, you know, those are New Mexico all the way, are going to be even in worse shape thanks to the, the loss of classroom time. And of course, New Mexico lost more classroom time than the vast majority of other states. So, Yeah, and you know, Paul, we have been talking about this for uh, at least a year and a half now. And uh, that's one of those things. We have a special session. Uh, we, you know, are we talking about that? How to, how to, uh, how to recover, how to get back in the game, as it were, from an academic point of view. And again, you know, U.S. is a, broadly speaking as a country, our averages uh, are not the greatest compared to other, many other uh, industrialized countries. And then as a state, we're down. And then uh, there's parts that, uh, you know, places in New Mexico where it's just abysmal and uh, things were bad and now they're worse. And so, yeah, uh, maybe we could talk about that at some point if, in this coming 30-day session as well. Now, they, they have put forth uh, more money to extend the school year. Uh, I, I, I think that has some merit for some kids, but it's certainly not, um, I, I, it's not the solution. The solution was to not keep the kids out of the classroom to begin with. And uh, unfortunately, that's exactly what our governor did. And uh, I think that, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about education and the national issue, that is a real sweet spot, I think, in terms of uh, political vulnerability for our governor. Because she's going to spend a lot of money, see oil and gas report earlier, uh, <laughs> on education. And it, it's the classic, just thought about this, Wally, but you know, it's like the classic story of the kid who has a parent who maybe maybe works 80 hours a week, or maybe they've just got a lot of other interests besides their child. And uh, so they you know, largely abandon the child to the Xbox or uh, some other uh, thing and don't really spend any time with them and then uh, come and spread gifts and buy them all kinds of goodies in order to retain their love. That, that seems to be the MLG uh, education path because she's going to spend all the money she can, 7% raises for teachers and uh, this, that, and the other. Uh, but when it comes to actual education outcomes, to the extent we're going to know anything more by uh, November of 2022, uh, it, none of it's going to be good because uh, all the other data from all the other states shows that it's bad. And, uh, you know, governor's done great damage to our children and our education system. Yeah, and you know we're 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 good on the inputs right now in New Mexico. So the resources we are dedicating, we're doing really, we're doing pretty well, and I would say really well uh, for similar uh, similar states that uh, you know we are uh, often judged against. But the outputs, that's where the issue is. Yeah. Now, uh, the film study, uh, latest film report come in, comes in from the state of New Mexico. And uh, read through it quite carefully. Uh, it's not a surprise that it doesn't 
say anything new. Uh, it certainly is an attempt to justify the film program and the subsidies, but there's a line tucked away on page 24 that says, this study does not include an analysis of tax impacts and focuses instead on economic ROI. Well, that is a, uh, a simple way to say we're not actually studying the economic impact of the Hollywood film uh, subsidies in the state of New Mexico because if you're not studying the tax impact, how are you studying the money that New Mexico actually invests and receives? Because where, what is New Mexico spending to get Hollywood to come here? Tax dollars. How do you generate tax dollars? Well, you have to tax other people doing other ac economic activities. And at what rate do you tax those tax uh, dollars to receive them? Well, about 5% of, right. of your economic activity, uh, whether it's your gross receipts or your income. And uh, that means you need about 20 times the, uh, uh, that, that to generate 5%, you know, that, that money. You need 20 times that economic activity in order to generate that 5%. Um, and uh, you know, none of the film studies show uh, an impact of that level, that magnitude. Uh, so they say uh, we spend about $160 million and generate $854 million in direct economic output. But the reality is uh, to generate enough to replace those tax revenues, you'd be required to generate a $3.2 billion economic output. Uh, needless to say, $854 million is nowhere close to $3.2 billion. And uh, the film program remains a major cash loser as an honest reading of all studies of said program would indicate. Yeah. And then many other states have had richer uh, film subsidies and they've uh, finally cried uncle New Mexico. Uh, we're, we're all in because we have the money to do it. And we're, that's what we're going to do. And again, uh, if we're looking at sustainable economic development, is this the thing? Uh, it doesn't look like it to me, but that is uh, that is our primary our primary focus right now in terms of things is getting rid of oil and gas and getting more film. Yeah, and uh, the, the analysis again is at heirsofenchantment.com. dot uh, com, and these these reports are bought and paid for not to do an honest analysis of the the film program but to justify the film program. And uh, uh, the reality is, is quite the contrary to what is indicated. Although some economic data that is presented in there is, is viable, it's valuable, you just have to know and remind yourself, where does government get its money? Well, it doesn't just have a money tree out back. They get to shake it and then invest it as they see fit. They have to actually tax it away from viable, unsubsidized economic activity. And the, the fact that you have to spend money shows that film is not in and of itself a viable uh, project. If you, on the other hand, just gave a gross receipts tax exemption to all restaurants in New Mexico, you would forego a lot of money, but you would still have a positive economic uh, return because those those restaurants pay taxes. Now, you're not losing net money. You're right. actually still generating money for the state of New Mexico. But And what page was that uh, tax comment on, Paul? Page 24. You know, and the reason it was on page 24 is they didn't want to highlight it, but I'm sure the, whoever did the study is going to uh, face scrutiny in the future about their prior work. And they, they needed to put that in there to uh, not be considered a total partisan and actually, oh, they asked me not to do that, and I put a disclosure on page 24. So, yeah, uh, their conscious conscience got the better of them. Yeah, well, it's, it's the same thing we always see from these reports. You know, ROI and uh, net economic impact and uh, you know, multipliers and all of these, you know, fudge, fudge <laughs> ways of dealing with things. When you actually talk about, is it a profit or a loss for the state of New Mexico, that's where the rubber hits the road. All right, we will leave it there. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. 
Subscribe to this show at Apple, Stitcher, or have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.